Sir Dr. Hart uh, Nozick. Dr. Nozick has spent actually most of his career at the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, um, NRA, where he's been recognized for a number of things. I mean, so he's an expert in quantum confinement in materials, so-called quantum dots, and understanding the confinement effect and how it shapes the spectrum of quantum dot particles. But also, um, didn't stop there, but went on to explore these materials for uh, photovoltaic um, application and most recently for photochemical uh, systems. Um, Dr. Nozick got his undergrad degree actually from Cornell and for the chemis in the room, he's a chemical engineer. And so he got his degree in the 1950s actually, quite a long time ago in chemical engineering, but continued on in physical chemistry at Yale. And, um, and as I pointed out before, um, has, an, has, an, has had an outstanding career at NREL, so he has been recognized at a variety of honors. The key ones I'd like to mention is that he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, plus a few others, right? So I, I want you to join me in welcoming him to Cornell, and to, um, and, you know, we all look forward to your lecture art. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Lyndon. It's a pleasure to be, be be here. I've been back many times since I graduated in 1959, which is uh, like 60 years ago. <laughs> and uh, things have changed. But um, uh, because I'm associated now with this uh, advisory board for the Cornell in Energy Systems Institute, I won't be able to uh, stay much beyond the end of the lecture to uh, answer questions. So if you have some really good questions. Don't hesitate to uh, interrupt the lecture and ask your question because there might not be time later. And I kind of give my talks in, um, in terms of uh, it's not totally a fixed lecture. I got a, more slides than I could cover in uh, the time allotted. So I kind of adjust things in real time. So if I'm slowed down, from questions, it's OK, because I can skip some of those slides. And you can always contact me later if you have questions that you didn't have time or were unable to ask. So um, I'm giving a talk first, uh, starting out with a general, a lot of this maybe you've been exposed to in your courses, but I'm, I don't know your background. So I'm going to start off with a, a rather general description of um, the status of um, energy and climate change in the present day. And it's a rather pessimistic view um, because, as you'll see, we're running out of time. I mean, climate change has been known since Arrhenius, who first proposed that CO2 is going to produce a uh, major increase in the temperature of the Earth, and this was over 100 years ago. And in more recent years, uh, it's been um, supported by science more and more. More and more uh, publications and analyses and uh, scientists have rung the, be the alarm bell about the dangers of uh, carbon dioxide increasing at such a rate that uh, it's going to cause uh, unacceptable levels of uh, temperature rise and climate change. And it's happening now. I'm not going to give the examples. I think I'm maybe preaching to the choir. But uh, there are many, many manifestations of climate change. So let me start by uh, just indicating that energy demand is on the rise. And it's correlated strongly with economic well-being. So underdeveloped countries, uh, in the past, it was like China, but now China's been, in the past decades, has uh, developed so rapidly that they are now a major contributor to uh, a major, a major u user of energy and correspondingly major emit emitter of carbon dioxide. And uh, the problem is that energy demand is, inc is continually increasing. And since um, 
And so these are some of the statistics. So last year, 2017, the demand went up by 2.1%. And, and most of it's uh, from, uh, renewal, from uh, fossil fuels, oil, gas, and um, oil, uh, coal. Coal is the worst because it's pure carbon, essentially, so you get the most CO2 by burning coal. Um, now, CO2 emissions, there's recognition among at least the developing countries that they need to reduce their emissions. And these countries here, which are uh, the, the only countries which had a decline um, in last year, uh, and the U.S. is increasing more, but it's because of the increase in the use of renewables. So th this plot just shows how e the um, consumption of energy is correlated rather well with the well economic well-being. So here, United States is in Norway. That's why President Trump says, where's my Norwegians? Because this is a country that uh, is very well off and uh, the citizens are, uh, are quite productive because they're in a good position economically. So you can see the, uh, China's moving up. They used to be way down here, but uh, China's developing uh, very rapidly and hence is using a lot of energy and is a major contributor now to the um, emission rate. So this just again shows that there's a correlation between the GDP, which reflects economic uh, development and well-being. And uh, as energy goes up, CO2 goes up because 70% of the energy produced in the world comes from uh, fossil fuels. And they produce CO2 when they're used. So you might have seen this. This is uh, some of the skeptics. There's a very strong uh, collection of, of uh, power uh, of rather powerful politicians um, who are against the idea that uh, there is climate change and it's produced by human activity and they point to the, the natural cycle and there is a natural cycle it has to do with the over time the changing of the axis of the earth's uh, orientation with respect to the sun um, and a few other factors that produce a natural cycle, but the period of the natural cycle from the peak CO2, and this goes back, now you can go back and find data that go back a million years. This goes back about a half a million years. Uh, the peak has uh, always been about 280 parts per million over the last million years. And uh, when we have ice ages, it drops to about 200. So that's a change of about 80 parts per million. And that's uh, with a peak to valley, except for these uh, mini uh, cycles, which in occur at a higher frequency than the major cycle. The um, change in the CO2 from 200, uh, when we have ice ages, to uh, 280, when we have moderate climate, like we had up until about 1850. Um, now, if we look at the CO2, instead of 280 parts per million, it's risen to 406 last year, and this year will probably exceed 410 parts per million. And so this is a, um, a serious problem because the, well, this is the uh, change in CO2 and, te uh, and temperature over just the past thousand years. This is the so-called hockey puck model that's been attacked again by climate um, skeptics because they claim that this data is flawed. But it's not flawed, um, and I'll show some data that, that proves that. But uh, this just taking, for example, the worst emitter of carbon dioxide, which is coal, coal unlike the last two years where there was an actual decrease in the use of uh, coal, now there's been a jump um, this year, in, or starting in 2017, mainly due to India and China, which are growing very rapidly and are using coal because it's the most um, readable form of fossil energy. 
So this paper here is very, very interesting and important because it shows that we're running out of time. And this is the negative, this is the negative news that uh, this plot shows the uh, time in years. And over here is the year, it will, is the emission rate reduction. And so far there's, there's uh, been only, except for one year, there's been emission increase every year since, um, since humans began to use um, fossil fuels hundreds of hundred thousand years ago and maybe even longer co2 has been going up and uh, in 2015 it went down by 0.6 percent but we're running out of time because we're over here at 2019 and we don't have a sustained reduction in emission despite all the you know publicity about uh, Paris agreements and uh, most recently other agreements from the United Nations uh, in which the whole world has agreed well we need to reduce emissions and they put forth plans to do this in reality it's not happening and right now we're negative so last year we went up by two percent and uh, so we're down here which means um, we're going if, if we continue with business as usual, as is said in this uh, field, if business as usual at minus uh, 2 percent, we're going to have something like a 10 to 15 percent increase in carbon dioxide unless we do something about it. So even if we did something about it and reduced it to 2 percent reduction per year, that means in 2019 we're going to be about here. We're stuck with 2.5 degrees centigrade rise. And the United Nations has said that the most we can tolerate is two degrees. So we're already, even at that very high reduction rate of, of reducing 2%, we're going to be stuck with uh, an, an unacceptable uh, increase in the temperature. Um, so what it implies that we have to go to a much higher level of reduction of um, emissions of carbon. Now, here's the, some encouraging news. Uh, photovoltaics is growing exponentially in terms of production and installation. It's an exponential increase in the amount of PV that's being produced. And if you um, look at this curve, it's interesting because the projection, you know, uh, renewables were always looked at in the past as being kind of uh, pie in the sky and uh, the projections of how much renewable would, would be produced has always uh, underestimated what's actually happen, happening. In 2018, it's estimated that the amount of photovoltaics installed will be 500 gigawatts, which is a half a terawatt. The United States currently uses about, um, I'd say, uh, two, ter two or three terawatts. So, PV is the fastest growing energy source and it's um, every year the projection gets better and better and even last year the projection being uh, 2017 uh, being about 400 it's still much less than what was projected to what it would be uh, in uh, 2018 like uh, projection made in, in 20, um, 20, 2015. So that means um, it's doing better than people thought. And this is a, a well-known curve from NREL showing the efficiency. I'll be talking about photovoltaics first, but there's two, f two topics I'll be covering today. One is photovoltaics and one is fuel because Photovoltaics makes electricity, uh, you know, as you know, and that's only about one quarter of the energy consumed is in the form of electricity. Three quarters to two thirds is in the form of liquid and gaseous fuel. So that's a tougher problem, and I'll show you where things stand with that. It's not as good as PV. PV is doing great, but it's still only 20 
5% of the amount of energy we use on Earth. So <laughs> even if all the electricity produced on Earth was done with PV, it's still not going to solve the emission problem in CO2. But uh, this curve shows all the technologies currently being developed. And you'll notice that um, uh, PV using silicon is the efficiency has not changed much over time compared to the new approaches, which are, these are the emerging technologies, which include the quantum dot solar cells, which I'll talk about because that's what I've been focused on recently. And those are called the third generation of PV. And, um, and then there's some new technologies that are growing rapidly in efficiency, like perovskites. That's shown here. The perovskites have gone from about a uh, few percent up to, uh, to exceed silicon uh, on the efficiency, on the effic efficiency chart. Uh, so it's above 20% now. And silicon really hasn't changed much, but yet it's the dominant form of photovoltaics, about 90 plus percent of the photovoltaic systems in use today are based on silicon. And it's been following what's called this learning curve over 40, greater than 40 years, which is quite remarkable. Um, starting in 1978, I joined NREL in 78, 40 years ago. That's when NREL was established by President Carter, and he was, uh, he was a nuclear engineer, so he was technically astute and recognized uh, just after the big oil crisis of the mid-70s. Uh, most of you weren't born then, but um, people, your parents were standing in line in, in, their, you know, in, in their cars trying to get gasoline because there was a shortage of gasoline due to the oil embargo of the 70s. So initially, renewable energy was driven by economic security because um, there was this big oil crisis that stimulated President Carter to uh, establish what was then called Solar Energy Research Institute up in Golden, Colorado. And that, he did that in 1976. He passed, uh, he was elected in 76. By 77, he succeeded in getting Congress to pass a law to establish this new institute. And I joined in 78, a year after it was formed. And the price of uh, photovoltaics at that time was like $10 a kilowatt hour. And the average price uh, was like uh, 15 cents. Now, as we'll see here, in 2018, the cost of photovoltaics is less than five, five cents a kilowatt hour. It's between three to five, and it's half the cost of electricity made from coal-fired power plants. So for 40 years, this curve has been decreasing by a 20% decrease in the cost of photovoltaics every time the capacity is doubled. So the capacity is now a half a terawatt. In 2018, it's over here. This was the goal for DOE, and it surpassed it by um, 10 years. So in 10 years, DOE back you know, 10 years ago was projecting the goal should be three cents a kilowatt hour for PV, and now it's uh, already reached three to five cents 10 years earlier. And if you look more closely, you see that in the last 10 years, there's been a, um, first there was like a slowing from 2001 to 2008. This had to do with economic problems in the, in the globally. But since 2008, the slope has doubled. So now the cost of PV over the last 10 years has dropped 45% every time the production level has doubled. And this point here was, this slide was presented at a conference at a, for this journal, uh, Energy and Environmental Science, EES. The, uh, it's a British journal published by the, um, um, uh, the UK Society for uh, Chemistry, analogous to ACS. And um, they celebrated their 10th anniversary in um, in, Pas in uh, Pasadena in California because they, well actually it was in Irvine, California where they have a National Academy, um, or the EES has, uh, the editor-in-chief is located there, Nate Lewis is his name. So uh, it's 
they had a lot to do with this because a lot of good papers were published in this journal. And anyway, they were happy to see that the slope doubled uh, when the journal was formed. But in any case, uh, it's on this amazing curve for 40 years if you, you know, just draw a line or try to draw the best line through all that data. Okay, now here's the problem. Um, about 10 years ago, this is, the situation was something like this. This plots the, it's kind of busy, but I'll just run through it quickly. Uh, this is the module efficiency, so that's the kilowatts uh, produced, or we'll say watts per square uh, centimeter. So you get one kilowatt per square meter or 100 millo uh, milliwatts per square centimeter or one kilowatt per square meter. And this is the cost per square meter. So um, if you're, f uh, say, 50% efficient, which is you know, very high, that's the goal of the, what's called the next generation photovoltaics, is to increase the efficiency to 50%, which means you're getting 500 watts per square meter because sunlight produces one kilowatt per square meter. So you're converting half of that input sunlight energy into um, useful free energy, either in the form of electricity or fuel, versus the cost. So if you divide the cost by the efficiency, you'll get the slope of these lines. And then you can, and that uh, turns out in units to be dollars per peak watt. So that's, when, that's how the uh, panels and the systems are rated. What's the cost of the peak watt? The peak watt is when the sun is at high noon and there's no clouds in the sky. Then you can measure what the efficiency is then, and that's how the panels are rated. So that's the dollars per peak watt. To get it into an energy, of course, energy is uh, watts times um, uh, time. So kilowatt hour, cents per kilowatt hours or dollar per kilowatt hours can be obtained from the dollars per peak watt by appro mul approximately by multiplying that dollars per peak watt by 0.05. That's a general rule of thumb, which works pretty well. So that takes into account the fact the sun isn't always shining, that there's clouds uh, around the world. The amount of sunlight you get average over the year varies. But 0.05 times that dollars per peak watt is a good uh, estimate of what the cost would be. Now, what's happened is that uh, initially, like when I you know, was at NREL initially, we were on this slope here, about $3 per peak watt. And uh, this, if you take into account the other part of the system besides the photoactive region of the device, which is uh, the silicon photoactive photovoltaic material. There's the inverter. You got to change the DC to AC. There's all the structure. There's maintenance, taxes, land uh, purchase, and so forth. So the assumption on this plot was that um, the cost, that's called balance of system plus the module. That, if you said those costs were equal, and that assumption is, has held pretty well over the 40 years. So even as the efficiency and the cost of, of silicon has dropped, so has the balance of system cost. So currently, when silicon is now at uh, four, three to five cents, say an average of four cents per kilowatt hour, the balance of system cost is still the same. About, so it's about 55%, and the cost of the PV silicon part is 40%. Is, is 40%. So uh, that's the assumption on this plot to give you the dollars per kilowatt hour. So, um, so it's it about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was about 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And the average of uh, the country is about 10, in the US is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And it's kind of held that way for many years. Uh, so silicon was here, and it wasn't competitive because it, you know, was something like um, a dollar. And the grid parity was the goal, and the short, shorter-term goal was to equal the cost of uh, electricity from coal or oil or even nuclear. But silicon has moved. If the efficiency hasn't gone up that much, but the, the cost of the modules and the balance of system, mainly due to the effort in China, has pushed this curve to the left in terms of silicon so that now 
the current day technology, which is essentially silicon, it's 90, maybe 92 percent of the market is crystalline silicon, is in this region, which is what we thought 10 years ago was the target for next generation. That's the uh, other approaches which have high efficiency and low cost. So as I say, the ratio of the slope of this line reflects the cost. Silicon is already there. So if silicon has reached what the next generation goal was, say, 10, 15 years ago. So in order for uh, renewable, renewable uh, photovoltaics to be competitive, you'd have to be perhaps over here, which is 50% uh, efficiency at uh, $75 per square meter for the module and $75 for the, for the uh, balance of system. So that's a, quite a challenge, and there are some approaches, which I'll, I'll discuss, which do look uh, or do show the potential pathway to bring the cost of silicon even lower than, one, than three to five cents, say one and a half cents. It's almost, it's approaching zero. So <laughs> that's quite an amazing technological achievement uh, driven by um, engineering. I mean, it's the production cost, the, uh, the value of um, scale, you know, the uh, uh, benefit of uh, large scale production always reduces, it reduces the cost of what you're producing when you produce it at high volume. So this just kind of repeats what I just said. So to be, um, to beat carbon now, you'd, ha uh, to beat carbon, um, or to beat PV produced from carbon-based fuel, coal uh, or oil or even nuclear, you'd have to have an efficiency of about 50%, and the cost of the module has to be $75 per square meter, which is a little bit cheaper than what glass costs. So that, that's uh, quite quite a challenge, but uh, we'll see that nanoscience and some other approaches can, in principle, reach those uh, really tough goals. Now the situation for fuels is different. There's no fuel, solar fuels industry, and that's, as I say, a bigger problem than electricity is to make fuel um, through, say, artificial photosynthesis. Some people call it that, or it's just, say, solar water splitting to produce hydrogen or to react uh, water with CO2 like plants do, but do it much more efficiently and at lower cost because plants are only maybe a half a percent efficient. And uh, using semiconductors or mole molecules of certain types, you can um, get the efficiency theoretically up to uh, 35% and uh, even exceed that uh, with an approach I'll mention later. So now, if going back to PV, since that's where all the action is in terms of uh, the real world, 50% um, of the absorbed energy of the solar spectrum produces electrons and positive charge where the electrons came from. They're pumped by the photons. So the solar spectrum ranges from 0.5 EV to about 3.5 EV. So that means um, when you do the calculation that Shockley and Quisar did in 1960, uh, they assume that all these, these are called hot electrons and hot holes. They relax to the band edges, say this is, a, uh, this is the band gap. So they show the optimum band gap was about 1.1 1 .1 uh, for silicon and to 1.4 for gallium arsenide. And this cooling of the hot electrons generally occurs in um, a picosecond or less. So it's like maybe a few hundred femtoseconds. 10 to minus 12 is one femtosecond. So it's very fast. So 50% of the energy is lost uh, through this cooling and, and converts the excess energy of the electrons and hole, holes, which is in the form of kinetic energy, into heat within a uh, very rapidly, less than a picosecond. And the other um, photons, which are less than the gap, because as I say, the solar spectrum runs from 0.5 to 3.5, and the optimum, according to the Shockley Chrysler limit, is um, about uh, 1.1 to 1.4 is the peak. Uh, 
efficiency at 33% is uh, because when you're less than the gap, you don't absorb the light. So there's many ways to, uh, or several ways to beat that shockley quasar limit. And this book here kind of summarizes them, written by Martin Green in, in um, 2005. And uh, Antonio Luca and Mar Antonio uh, Marty in uh, 2012 and 2003, they got a book called Third or Next Generation uh, Photovoltaics. But I'm going to focus here where we use the hot electrons to either uh, produce a higher voltage by extracting them before they cool or using the uh, high energy to produce more electron hole pairs. So these are the two processes I just mentioned. One is if you can extract the hot electrons before they cool, then you get a higher voltage. If you, uh, that's hard to do because they cool so fast. You've got to get them to the interface and extract them to the next phase, separate them and, and collect them before they cool. Or this works better, actually, is to take the uh, high energy uh, photons, which have uh, energy at least twice the band gap, that's to conserve energy, and can make two electrons per photon. So that's called, it's, it, it was known for 40 years in bulk semiconductors, but wasn't used because of the band structure of silicon and other gallium arsenide. You have to go to very high energy in order to get that effect of creating multiple electron hole pairs per photon and that energy was outside the solar spectrum so it was the abandoned but uh, it's been found that when you have size quantization in small semiconductor nanocrystals called quantum dots or nanocrystals that this process becomes efficient and um, that's what we were working on so the hot electron process works like this. You, uh, tr this just shows one photon, but of course there'll be a distribution in the real, if you use sunlight, there'll be a distribution, but they have an average temperature and a, a Boltzmann distribution that has a high temperature, which is about 3,000 degrees. And you extract it from the peak and you collect it if you're making a PV device with a low work function contact. So uh, this is the extraction process, and um, we, we did demonstrate that you can do this in, uh, not for energy conversion, but just to do electrochemistry. You can um, drive a redox reaction, which is above the, the band edge. Normally, most all solar cells today undergo this cooling process where the excess energy is lost as heat. And that, uh, in the Shockley, analysis, you assume uh, that's all solar cells today operate that way, and it assumes that uh, this happens. You can't beat this cooling. And um, you also, it also assumes that the only loss is the re-radiation to the sky, because uh, according to Einstein principle, whatever you, when, when you absorb light, you have to emit light. And at equilibrium, they're equal. The emission and the absorption become equal when the system is, uh, say, an open circuit and, and there's no other loss like uh, imperfections in the crystal and so forth. So that's the shockley quasar limit. It's, it's um, very well known. You if you've taken courses in uh, let's see. Yeah, if you've taken courses, you've probably seen the shockley quasar. So the efficiency is about 33% between 1.1 to 1.4 volts, like, like silicon to gallium arsenide, those are, or cadmium telluride fits in there, and those are the materials being used in today's solar cells. But if you could um, use the hot electrons, you more than double the efficiency. The electron temperature is about 3,000 degrees uh, if you have a flat plate collector on Earth. Um, the temperature of the surface of the sun is 6,000, but you don't get 6,000 degree electrons uh, because you're re-radiating re some of that absorbed photon flux from the sun back to, back to the sky. So that's very attractive because the efficiency in this case, the ultimate efficiency is uh, more than double the Shockley-Quasar limits, about 66%. 
And so in the 80s, quantum dots arrived, and there's some new physics there. First of all, you don't have to conserve momentum because uh, if you just apply the uncertainty principle, you know where the electrons are, so you don't know the momentum. And that's the uncertainty principle. That means uh, it's not a good quantum number. So all you have to do is satisfy energy, not momentum. And that, that means you can go to much, you can go to energies which are within the solar spectrum, uh, in the visible region of the solar spectrum, to get this effect in quantum dots. And uh, also, you have discrete states. When you quantize, instead of having a continuum like you do in both materials, you have discrete states. So to get the cooling, you uh, have to invoke more than one phonon per electron. So that slows the cooling. And uh, so the quantization is shown here. This is bulk material. But when it's quantized, you have these discrete states. The cooling can be slow. And you have a difference in the, in the density of states. So the, the quantum dots look like a molecule. It's a big molecule in that they have discrete states which are separated uh, in energy. That means uh, to go from here to here or from here to here, you need more than one phonon scattering off one electron to cool it. And that is a multi-particle collision or scattering event and is much less probable. So this is, say, a nice picture of a quantum dot. This is silicon. It's probably got, you could see the atoms of silicon all lined up here. This is a perfect crystal which can be produced in the uh, lab. And um, uh, these crystals uh, show emission, which is right at the band edge. So there's no trapping or uh, defects either inside or on the surface. Um, now, we uh, at NREL, or it's now called uh, NREL, but it used to be called SERI, as I mentioned, Solar Energy Research Institute. But now it's the National Renewable Energy Lab. The name was changed in 1990 by President uh, George Walker Bush, the first Bush. And uh, it's a national lab, just like Argonne, Brookhaven, Sandia, and Los Alamos, and so forth. Um, we abandon uh, hot carrier effects because they're re real hard to uh, produce in terms of solar cells. But r very recently, there's been, just in the last three years, these events which uh, kind of rejuvenated interest in hot electron extraction. So, and it happens in perovskites, as you probably know. Perovskites are like the hot new material that uh, has an efficiency more higher than silicon uh, coming up from what it was like five years ago, it was like 2 or 3%. Now it's uh, like 23%. But it's, un it's unstable. It's, it's got some um, uh, problem. It's a hybrid uh, organic, uh, inorganic material. But it slows down the cooling. So there's been 33 papers uh, since uh, 2015 to uh, this year uh, showing slow cooling, which is what you need. You have to have the cooling be um, slower than the extraction or the multiplication to get more than one electron per photon. You've got to beat the cooling. And so it, somehow these, there's a lot of it, uh, possibilities for perovskites in hot electron or producing multiple carriers, electron hole pairs uh, with light. And then um, this was something that we, we had shown before, and this paper here uh, confirmed that you can slow down the cooling in a, in a quantum confined a, a region of a solar cell where you have uh, electron, uh, con where you have either super lattices or quantum dots. Um, so that just shows some of the papers. High, they were high profile papers by high profile authors. And uh, in all types of perovskites, all the ones that are known, including the initial one, which is methyl ammonium lead, and then there's formidamide and uh, uh, substituted for um, the cesium, there's cesium lead bromide and some work on the tin compound. They all showed slow cooling. So it seems to be a natural effect of perovskites and some of the people High-profile people are jumping into it, and they're listed here. So um, 
I'll just skip this one. Now, jumping to the other process, which is to use the uh, photon energy to produce additional electron hole pairs. This is called impact ionization in bulk, but it's not useful because you have to go to very high energy to get this process in, in the bulk. But in semiconductors, this is what happens uh, in, in the bulk. You have to conserve momentum, which means this process of the, the whole scattering off this electron and exciting it across the band gap, has, they have to cancel each other out and that requires a high energy photon. So it's not useful in bulk materials. But in quantum dots, since you only have to satisfy energy, you can, um, it becomes efficient even at, uh, in the middle of the solar spectrum. You don't need a high energy photon. But the efficiency is less because you have a threshold. You have to have at least twice the band gap for the photon energy, which means from a photon that's between one and two times the gap still loses the excess energy as heat. So the threshold for the multiplication, called multiple exton generation, is 2 eg. And uh, this just shows uh, how this process, you know, grammatically in a cartoon uh, works in a, a quantum dot is that this high energy photon, which is tw at least twice the gap, can produce two electron hole pairs per photon, and this process is called uh, MEG, or multiple exton generation, and it, it, it occurs quite efficiently. And uh, in the ideal case, it, it shows a step, a, a ladder type behavior, so that every time the photon energy is n times the gap, you'll get n electron hole pairs. So if you're twice the gap, you'll get two. If you're three times the gap, you'll get three, and so forth. So the quantum yield undergoes that uh, relationship. And, but most of the systems today uh, show this linear relationship, even with an onset of two. In order to get the staircase, the ratio between the cooling rate and the MEG rate has to be about a difference of 100. So the, you have to be 100 times faster in the MEG process than you are in the cooling, which is possible. And this is the Shockley-Quisar calculation for the MEG. It's uh, now about 46%, so it's about 50% higher. And um, that just shows that you've got to, you know, the cool, in that process, you put in the photon, you want to avoid this cooling and make this process, which uh, gives you this, the second electron hole pair, uh, to be about 100 times faster, and then you could get that, approach that staircase. There's a molecular analog. Uh, those of you who are interested in chemistry will uh, appreciate the fact that this process also occurs in molecules. It's called single fission. If the triplet state is halfway between the ground state and the first excited state, you can produce two triplets per absorbed photon. I won't talk about this, but this is a big field in chemistry. There's uh, hundreds of papers now uh, studying single fission in molecules for this uh, application. So we can build solar cells like this, quantum dots. Uh, and we showed for the first time that you can get a quantum yield in a solar cell, it's never been shown before, uh, greater than 100%. So in this region, the blue end of the, of the spectrum uh, produces more than one electron hole pair. It's not, it's not up to 200. You don't get twice as many, but you get about 20% more electrons uh, than you would in a normal device. Um, now the big effect uh, is that if you combine MEG plus solar concentration, this is the normal shockley quasar at one sun, but if you go to say 300, 500 suns, the curve changes dramatically and the peak is very high. Here it's 70%, but the band gap is now very small, like 0.2. And basically, it's because the multiplication becomes very large. So if you had a, a low energy photon, like 0.2 to 0.4, um, and you compare it to an average solar photon, which is, say, 2 eV in the middle of the solar spectrum, you can get five electrons per photon. So it's this large multiplication 
of, fo of the number of carriers you get when you use small gap that gives you this big advantage where the power conversion efficiency can be as high <laughs> if you had a 0.2 EV band gap that's like 75%. So it's, it's m almost, uh, it's more than double. It's almost, it's like two and a half times the shockley quasar limit. But you don't have to go to 0.2 because you got to, if you say make fuel, you want to split water, you need about 1.6 volts. So even at uh, 0.6 volts, uh, say if you had a quantum dot with 0.6 volts, you could have a 50, almost a 50% um, conversion efficiency with a solar concentration of 500x. So that's one way to get that big uh, effect. Now there's materials that show that silicon, even silicon itself has uh, some small band gap. Uh, normally it's 1.2. 1.1 volt, but you can have a 0.3 EV band gap of silicon in this phase, silicon 12, uh, it's made at higher pressure, so that's one possibility. Another one is to use transition metal calcogenides, and there's a whole bunch of them, some of which have low band gaps, so these would be very good to combine MEG with uh, solar concentration. And uh, if you look at the quantum yield versus the uh, photon energy compared to the band gap, you can see the staircase is being approached by some of these uh, layered compounds like um, molybdenum ditelluride and tungsten diselenide and some uh, other calcogenides which aren't layered. But there's some encouragement that you, know, you can get even three electrons per photon with MOTE2 at uh, three times the band gap. So we're approaching this ideal staircase function. Now for solar fuels, you need, just like photosynthesis, you need two band gaps of different size. Okay, I'll finish up in, a couple, in about two minutes. If you can do it with no bias, you can make what we call the photochemical diode, where you have two, two band gaps in series. The light comes in and you get a boost in voltage and you can split water. And uh, this just shows why you need it. But you could have uh, buried junctions. If you want to do chemistry, instead of having a semiconductor liquid interface, which is the field of photoelectrochemistry, where the junction that separates the charge is between the semiconductor and the liquid, here the, the voltage is produced by a semiconductor and a PN junction. But if you had metal contacts, you would bury the junction. So it's called buried junction. So it doesn't see, uh, under excitation, you, the semiconductor doesn't see the liquid and there's no photo corrosion. You don't have to worry about the band edges being matched because they move automatically to allow holes to oxidize water, electrons to reduce H plus. You could, doesn't matter what the voltage comes from. It could be a disensitized system like a Gretzel cell with two photosystems. Just bury it in this dashed line. Uh, I would point out that this was shown by Jack Kilby at um, uh, Texas Instruments where he was using small particles of silicon back in the uh, early 80s to produce splitting HBR. But you could use four of those in a Kilby system to split water. And so you could use concentrated light to get that big efficiency, like I said, for water splitting in this system and reduce the, cur the current density so you don't have a high over voltage. So I'll just conclude now by uh, just indicating, as I said, silicon has plunged in price and it's now in a 45% reduction per doubling of, uh, per of uh, panels. And um, once you have cheap electrons, you can do electrochemistry with those electrons uh, to make uh, any, like um, syngas, you know, make any, take carbon dioxide with cheap electrons in water, you can make a, almost any fuel you'd like. So that's my view is that you should use P, cheap PV cells with buried junctions to produce fuel. And um, perovskites look interesting because Cooling seems to be very slow in perovskites. So I just thank some of the people that I worked with at NREL. Thanks for your attention.
to uh, produce this, and I was wondering how you view that impacting TV cells over the next hundred years, different with the tradition of them being a main source of energy production. Um, well, silicon, or just in general? Silicon, or you know, mining lead, for example. Okay. Well, that's already included in the, um, in the cost of the silicon. So the cost of the silicon, which comes from sand, say, I mean, <laughs> lots of silicon out there, is, has uh, the processing of that into, a sol into pure silicon and then into solar cell, that cost is also plunged along with the, um, without the efficiency going up that much. So. It looks like that's not a, a problem for large-scale production of silicon because that learning curve will continue into the future. And even if we stopped uh, learning, we're at uh, two to, uh, three to five cents a kilowatt hour, which is pretty darn cheap. And so those electrons produced by PV panels are cheap enough now to consider using a good catalyst, that's where the research is. If you want to make fuel, to use a good catalyst with cheap electrons and do electrochemistry to make and use, make anything. You can make uh, alcohols or so hydrocarbons. Kind of a related question there. So you, the cost you were thinking, I presume, is not just the financial, but the CO2 cost, which is your sure. whole CO2 mm -hmm. life cycle. Th is it, does it work out? I mean, if you, because mining is heavily energy intensive. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I haven't seen an anal I'm not familiar with the analysis on uh, CO2 emission through the whole process, life cycle of uh, silicon panels. That's an interesting question, if that's what you're asking. Not yes. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, toxicity is the main drawback to perovskites if it's got the lead in it. Even though it's a compound and as a compound, lead's in there as a compound, not metal. Lead metal is more toxic. So cadmium telluride is even more toxic than lead, the cadmium is. But it's allowed in Europe, and Europe's very strict on uh, on, on toxic metals, but they made an exception for cadmium telluride as long as it's encapsulated and recycled. So it's guaranteed by the company for say 20 years and they guarantee to remove it and recycle it. So, but I think psychologically it's, even though you can argue, this environmentalists can argue uh, cadmium or lead I mean, there's plenty of there's more lead coming out of burning coal than you would ever get from using a perovskite. But still, the psychological impact is so severe among a powerful environmental lobby that uh, it's going to be a problem for large-scale uh, use of lead-based or cadmium-based um, PV or solar fuels materials. Yeah, the recycle back to the solar cell. What degrades in the solar cell is not so much the photoactive part, but everything else, the, the contacts and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I missed the first part of your question, but the quality, it, it would be reflected in the fact that, I guess, the efficiency hasn't increased very much, but the cost reduction has been so s strong that it makes, the, when you divide the cost per unit area over the watts per unit area, or the cost, yeah, the cost per unit area over the power per unit area delivered, you it looks good. So 
you don't suffer much in the quality by increasing the uh, production and lowering the cost of silicon. So one of the, so one of the things I've heard related to the question is that the quality has gone down because you can use smaller amounts of silicon, less silicon per cell. And I wonder in terms of now the cost over the lifetime of the cell. This is now the cost to the owner of the solar panel. Is that an issue? I mean, is that... Well, it is true. The, the silicon cells are about half the thickness of yeah. where they were. Um, in terms of the owner, I mean, now the uh, the new model is that the house, if you want to put it on your house, you don't have to put up twenty or thirty thousand dollars to put up a PV panel on your roof. There's companies like Sun City, which Tesla bought for to power their Tesla cars. Um, they'll put up the panels and maintain them, and you just pay like you would to an, a utility, a, a fixed cost per month of electricity, which would be lower than what you're paying to the regular power company today. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. So thank you guys.